Father, we thank you for your love and your mercies. We thank you that you're always with us. Jesus said, I am with you always. We thank you once more for the privilege of being together. We pray that you will protect us, you will guide us. It, it will be your voice that we hear. We know that you're doing something in this world and you are trying to bring the Seventh-day Adventist people back into line. Help us to be part of that. Yes, Lord. May we see that we as your people are the one object on this earth that you love and you protect in a very special way. May we constantly realize that you are developing a true brotherhood. May we be part of that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. In thinking about today's session, I was reading some different things, old things, because what we have to deal with, anything that we read from today is part of the problem. We have to go back to see if anybody really understood this in the past. And there are people who have understood. And they have written on it. And I ran into a statement written in 1911 by a historian, a true historian, I didn't write down the source, who said something in 1911 that just stirred my mind. Here's basically what he said. That in the age, the first age, the beginning age where the church first began to develop and paganism was coming in already, he says that there was the same intellectual and moral sphere and so it was easy to pass from one to the other, from paganism to the Christianity that had already been infiltrated by Satan, to pass from one to the other without shock or interruption. And that, to me, just... Christianity had already moved that far that the pagans were moving this way into it, and it was no big deal to them. But the other thought to me was that a Christian could go the other way, too, and have the same experience. No big difference. And that, to me, was terrible. And this was happening in the early stages of the church. And this historian said some other things, and he says it was a mystical spirit. He used the word spirit. A mystical spirit from the east. It came from the Orient, see? That's where the devil started all this stuff. And it was prepared for the universal church. Now, this was written in 1911 about paganism in the early church. Now, does any of that sound like it could be happening again? It's the same mystical spirit, only it's named something different today. All right, I want to begin by trying to show what the real problem is, and we'll, we'll see why there's been a shift. In the uh, first selected messages, page 84. Let me see if I can get back to... Uh, I have some wonderful quotations here. Three selected messages. I've got too many quotes in my head for this. Three selected messages. 84. All right, Ellen White says this. One thing is certain. Now, does that sound like it can't be changed? <laughs> One thing is certain. Those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner 
will first give up their faith in the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimonies of God's Spirit. That's one sentence. It's a terrible sentence. Let's get at it. This is certain. Nothing can change this. One thing is certain. Seventh day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner. <laughs> she doesn't say this will never happen. She says it is certain. Seventh day Adventists who do it. So there are Seventh day Adventists who are going to do it. Seventh day Adventists who take their stand under the banner will first. Before anything else, they're going to give up the spirit of prophecy, the testimonies of the Spirit of God. Now, we need to be clear, first of all, that we understand the spirit of prophecy is not Ellen White. Okay? There are a lot of people that think when you say Ellen White, that's the spirit of prophecy. No. They're not the same thing. Ellen White is Ellen White. The spirit of prophecy is something different. The spirit of prophecy is the spirit of God. And everything that God does on earth is done through Christ. Patriarchs and Prophets 366. Okay. So, the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Jesus. And that's what the Bible calls it. The testimony of Jesus. So when a person gives up the spirit of prophecy, they're not giving up Ellen White. They're giving up Jesus himself. Okay? So when a person stops being a Seventh-day Adventist in their mind, there's a reason for that. And that's what we're trying to understand here. This is something very important. And she says there are going to be Seventh-day Adventists to do it. This was understood by the pioneers. Spicer, you might remember that we read a little booklet, part of one, that says how the spirit of prophecy met a crisis. That was the Kellogg thing. Okay. She says how, the, uh, Spicer said how, but when he talked about Ellen White, he never in that little booklet called her the spirit of prophecy. He always said, Ellen White, the agency of the spirit of prophecy. The agency. She was the agent. She was the messenger, but she was not the spirit of prophecy. This was clearly understood by the pioneers and everybody who really knew how it worked. So we need to know that as we begin. But the important thing here is that if a person comes under Satan's banner, it's because they have given up the spirit of Jesus. Are you beginning to see a connection in what we're doing here? To give up the spirit of the Son of God is fatal. Now what is the banner of Satan on this earth? Okay, I shouldn't ask you questions like that. I haven't given you enough information yet to know what we're doing here. Remember in Great Controversy, page 50, I better read again. I, I keep forgetting. We need documentation for all of that. Okay, Great Controversy. This compromise between paganism and Christianity resulted in the development of the man of sin. Okay, this is our subject today, this compromise between paganism and Christianity, so that when you move from one to the other, there was nothing shocking about it. There was no, 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 no real difference when this was taking place. But she says this compromise developed into the man of sin. Now we're talking about Roman Catholicism, aren't we? 
foretold in prophecy as opposing and exalting himself above, above God, that gigantic system of false religion is the masterpiece of Satan's power. There's the banner. The banner of Satan is to do things like the Catholic Church. Because that's where his power is all centered, is in the papacy. Down a little bit further, she says, uh, the, to secure worldly gains and honors, the church was led to seek the favor and support of the great men of earth. Was Constantine a great man? Okay, she, she deals with that. And having thus rejected Christ, rejected Christ, there's the banner. She was induced to yield allegiance to the representative of Satan, the Bishop of Rome. Okay. So now we know where the banner is. The banner is, is the Pope, the representative of Satan, which is the Roman Catholic system, which we know in the Bible is the mother and the mother of daughters, which turns out to be apostate Protestantism. So we've gone from Satan to Rome to Protestantism to, oh, we haven't done that. Let's just leave it there for right now. We want to see how the beast Rome was formed and then what it is that the Protestants picked up to become the image of the beast. You know, the old pioneers used to have a, an interesting argument when they talked to people about the image of the beast. I said, if you want to know about the image, you first have to know who the beast is. <laughs> and once you get all the features of the beast figured out, then you know what to look for in the image. It's a very sound argument. <laughs> okay? So that's what we are going to try to do here. We are going to under try to understand how paganism and what it is got into the early church and how that formed the papacy and how that developed into the apostate Protestant churches and where it's going today and who is affected. Okay? And this is very easy once you see it, but first you have to look at it carefully. Let's see, I need another computer. I don't even have it here. Just a minute. I have something I want to read to you from uh, Sutherland. Do you know that name? Sutherland was the big name in our church history concerning education. He and Percy McGann were the two who developed education for Seventh-day Adventists according to the principles of God. And it wasn't doing too well in the system, so they went independent. They went out there to do it as self-supporting missionaries, and Ellen White backed them. She said, they are doing the real plan. Now, I want to read you something he said in front of the General Conference in 1903. They gave him an opportunity to speak for a few moments, and instead of giving a report on education, the, how things were going in the church schools, he wanted to give some principles, and I think the Lord was leading him to do that. I'm not sure who heard him <laughs> or even who listened because he said some mighty important things. I'm going to read you just one or maybe two little paragraphs here so you can catch the tone of what he was doing. Clement, Origen, and others of the early Christians who were only partially converted to the Christian truth, believed that it would not be possible to carry 
to the heathen world the gospel in its strength and power. Now I'm going to stop for just a moment. These names may not mean a lot to you yet, but they're going to mean very but a, a big deal before we're done here. Clement is in history known as Clement of Alexandria. That's how he's known. And origin, of course, is the big heretic. Even the Catholic Church got rid of him, excommunicated him. Clement and Origen and others of the early Christians. Now Sutherland knows all of this history. And he's not saying very much. He just said those two names. But almost every name that you can name among the church fathers is in the same uh, condition. All right, let me continue reading. They believed it would not be possible to carry to the heathen world the gospel. The way it was. The way it really was. In his strength, he says. And power, unless the ministers and the teachers of the early Christian church should receive a training from the worldly educators in the worldly schools. So we cannot take Christianity to the world, the gospel, until we can say it like they say it in the schools. The worldly schools, because that's the only kind there was. We had to train our ministers in worldly schools. So they advocated the idea of sending to the worldly institutions for a better training than the Christian church, as they supposed, would be able to give the best of their young men. So the very first philosophy that of these men was that we cannot give the gospel to the world until we can talk like the world. So we'll send our best men to the worldly schools and the worldly schools will teach them how to talk much better than the church can. Yeah, that was... Now this is Sutherland talking to the General Conference in 1903. I want you to remember that. All right, continuing. These young men remained in those pagan institutions a number of years and came out and stepped into their places in the church as ministers and teachers. The Bible was then interpreted through pagan minds. Are you listening? He's saying the early church was trained by pagans to teach Christianity. So when these people became ministers in the early Christian church, they were teaching through pagan minds. And soon all faith and belief in the word of God were destroyed and the way for the dark ages was prepared. This union of Christian education with pagan education brought about by sending the young people of the Christians to the worldly schools, the mixture of good and evil is called today by Seventh-day Adventists the papacy, the beast. The papacy, the beast, is only a condition of mind and heart which makes one accept men's ideas instead of God's truth. I'm going to say that one again. That is the mind of the papacy, to make men accept men's ideas instead of God's truth. That is all it is. Quoting again, this was the papacy in their early centuries. It is the papacy in the 20th century Whenever that may be found, wherever it may be found, that even in our own church. Did he say that? Did he say that in front of the General Conference in 1903? That the mind of the papacy is the mind of the papacy even if it's found in our own church. What is that mind? 
to accept men's ideas instead of the Bible truth, the God's truth. What was the problem as far as he was concerned? An education that is part from God and part from the world. That's the problem. And he hit the nail squarely on the head. Because if you go into history, and we're not doing that today, but I just want to say a few things here. In the early church, they began to realize that if they did not train their children themselves, they would never become Christians. And if they didn't hold the children, they'd be, got, they'd be lost. So they began to develop in the early ages a system to keep them away from the pagans. They would not send their children to be trained by pagans. And martyrdom was one of the first things that came into the church because of that. These people understood we must educate our own children. And while they were doing that, paganism was losing its hold on the empire. And the devil saw that. There's no way he could allow Christians to educate their own children from the Bible. So he began to fight that. And we see the result of that in the papacy. We're not going to go through any of that today. We just want to know that's what happened. Now we can see it again at the Reformation. During the Reformation years, the early years, Martin Luther and the others saw that they could not allow the Catholic Church to train their children. They knew, though, that would be deadly. So they began establishing their own schools. And during the time that their schools were operating and things were going along biblically, the Catholic Church was starting to suffer. It was having genuine problems until a man by the name of Loyola came up. And I don't want to get into this history, but the first thing he did was show, we have to get the education back into our hands. And it was just a matter of 30 or 40 years that they had the children confused again. And the Reformation was going down. Because the key is the educational system. Who trains the children? Who teaches the world? Is it the people of God, or is it the papacy? All right, so we are beginning to focus on uh, the philosophy here that is either from God or from Satan. And by the way, there are a lot of people who think that God doesn't have a philosophy. Well, of course he does. There is God's philosophy and there is Satan's philosophy. And this is not the subject today either, but I just want to say this, that Satan's philosophy is very easy to see. It is all about self. It is selfish. And God's philosophy is all for the other. Bless the other. Those are the two basic philosophies. There's two minds in this world. The mind of Satan and the mind of God. And all selfishness comes from Satan. So that's all I'll say about that. I want to go to uh, Colossians 2.8. Alright, Colossians 2.8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Now, Paul did not say through philosophy. He said through philosophy and vain deceit. He's talking about a particular kind of philosophy. Okay? After the philosophy he's talking about here is after the tradition of men. There it is. Don't let men be the ones you listen to. You listen to the truth of God. All right? He's warning us here about Roman Catholicism. But he's warning us about more than Roman Catholicism. And that's what we're trying to understand here. He did not use the word Roman. And he did not use the word uh, Roman philosophy or Roman church. He just used the word philosophy. So Paul knew something that is way before the Roman church. 
And that's what we have to look at. So he says here, there's a difference between the tradition of men, their philosophy, and the world. He says, and not after Christ. So there are two philosophies. There is the philosophy of Christ, and there is the philosophy of the world, which is called vain. And we could add another word here, ambitious, because we're going to try to put those two words together as we go along here. Now the thing that kept the early Christians together and kept their educational system true and intact was the Bible. Now when I say the Bible, I mean the Bible. The New Testament Bible was the Apostolic Bible. There is no other Bible. It's the Apostolic Bible. And as long as they moved with the Apostolic Bible, everything was okay. But Ellen White tells us in early writings that men came in and started changing the Word of God. These men were very smart. And they were so smart, they said, the apostles did not know how to write correctly. We'll clean it up for them. We'll fix it up. So, another line of books that were calling themselves Bible was started. There are two lines of Bible in the world today. That which was from the apostles and one which was from these men. And it's these men that we want to look at. We want to see who they were and why they did what they did. Because they're the ones who developed the educational system that the papacy uses and that has infiltrated all schools today. All right. The Bible that they used, the false Bible, brought in some strange ideas as we will begin discussing here, but it culminated in another God. The Sunday God. That line of Bibles and that false education created the papacy and it brought Sunday out of nowhere. <laughs> Not out of nowhere, there was Mitra, there was... By that I mean nowhere from God. <laughs> okay? So, what we have happening here is through this false educational system and the teachers in that false educational system, we have... Catholicism, we have the immortal soul, we have Sunday, all of that came from the false Bible. Okay? But God has a true Bible and a true people coming along, known as the Walden Seas, the Huguenots, the Vaudois, which reach all the way to the Reformation, and they have the truth. Now that's a very quick synopsis of the problem developing in the early ages. Now, I want to now try to indicate why we are moving along this vein. I have a book in front of me here that you all have seen and understand what's in it. It's called The Trinity. And we are not discussing the Trinity to, per se today. We're trying to get below and beneath that problem to see why we have the Trinity today, where it shouldn't be. This book, Trinity, was written by three, Trinity, three people from the seminary, two who sit on the chair and one who uh, is in the same department. They're all historians. Two have PhDs and another one is working on his PhD. Now, I don't want to get into personalities all the way through this, but I have to mention this, that if you study the history of these men, all three of them have done work in other schools other than Seventh-day Adventist schools. The one who is working on his PhD is working on it at Notre Dame. Yes, he's working for a PhD from Notre Dame so that he can teach in a Seventh-day Adventist seminary. Now, I'm not going to say any more than that, 
until we get down into this further to see what is happening. All right, in this particular book on page 135, our subject today came out of this page. Reading. Origin. Origin, whose scriptural commentaries set the stage for these debates, was likely the single most influential interpreter of the Bible in the history of Christianity. I want to remind you, this is a Seventh-day Adventist book, supposedly. I just read you a sentence we're going to talk about extensively. Although he was not always original in his understanding, he most impressively achieved his goal of bringing together valuable early interpretations of Scripture. His numerous commentaries gathered a tremendous amount of previous scriptural interpretations and did as well include many of his own viewpoints. <laughs> Later, students of Scripture greatly appreciated both his collected commentary and his original work, viewing him as a repository of Christian interpretation. As a result, Christian teachers considered it important to be seen in agreement with Origen when engaging in any theological debate during the 3rd and 4th centuries. Well, now he said something that is true here. Origen was the big name back then. But we're going to see what that means in the history of Christianity as we study this. Uh, I'm going to skip down now to another paragraph. Whether or not um, there's a story told about him, and that's what he's talking about here. Let me, whether true or not, the very fact that people suggested it of him testifies to his level of commitment to personal morality and spirituality. Now, you see, Origen is very spiritual, and he has given us one of the best commentaries in Christianity so far. Now, I'm going to skip down again. Although church historians have often correctly criticized him as being responsible for directing Christian scholarship into allegorical methods, his excellent literal and typological interpretations of Scripture have been equally influential. This man, the head of the history department at the Seventh-day Adventist Seminary, has made these comments about origin. Now we need to back up here a little bit and see if any of these statements are true. What question a professor of history at the seminary? Well, I think we should take a look. In volume five of the testimonies, it's a uh, 5T217. My brain played a trick on me there. It says, I am filled with sadness when I think of our condition as a people. The Lord has not closed heaven to us, but our own course of continual backsliding has separated us from God. I'm not going to continue reading that paragraph. You can read it for yourself. I'm going to begin now the paragraph which bears on what we're talking about here. The church has turned back from following Christ, our leader, her leader, and is steadily retreating toward Egypt. Yet few are alarmed or astonished at their want of spiritual power, doubt, and even disbelief of the testimonies of the Spirit of God is leavening our churches <clears throat> everywhere. Satan would have it thus. The testimonies are unread and unappreciated. Now, you remember the first quotation? Those Seventh-day Adventists who come under Satan's banner. So she didn't say it might happen. She says it's going to happen. And those who do will first give up their belief in the testimonies of the Spirit of God. 
And here she says, that doubt and disbelief of the testimonies of the Spirit of God is loving in our churches everywhere. What? What? She's alive. Well, she's alive. It's already happening, what she said. Now she said, we have left Christ and we are steadily retreating toward Egypt. Now, everybody I have ever talked to thinks they understand what that means. It means going back to the world. But that's not what she's saying. She, of course, knew as much about the history as Sutherland did. And he already has given us the clues that there was something happening in paganism, infiltrating Christianity, that changed the educational systems to create the papacy. And that way of thinking that the papacy was created for was to make men believe what men say instead of what God said. And that kind of educational system came out of Egypt. She says we are steadily retreating toward Egypt. We are going back to what the devil did in the East. He brought it to Egypt, which was picked up by the Greeks, which was then picked up by the Romans and became the system of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Protestant churches have it. What came out of Egypt? That's what we want to find out. What came out of Egypt? Well, it didn't come out of all of Egypt, and it didn't come out of the pharaohs. It didn't come out of the pharaohs. It came out of Alexandria. <laughs> yeah. Ammonius was the first one. He established a school. And we will talk about this more in detail later. We're just trying to catch a round look at this. Ammonius was a philosopher, a Greek philosopher in Alexandria who knew the philosophical history, who knew the writings of the major philosophers. And in this school he taught people how that all works, that pagan philosophy. But he claimed to be a Christian. But he was a pagan philosopher. Clement of Alexandria comes along and he also is a Greek pagan philosopher who claims to be a Christian. Sutherland called these people half converted or half pagans, whatever. But you can't be a half Christian. That's not possible. These people were pagans claiming to be Christians. Clement of Alexandria taught origin. So we have a line here of Ammonius Clement, and we have Origen, and Origen became the greatest church father of the Roman Catholic Church. A pagan philosopher who, this book, the Trinity, instead of calling him a pagan philosopher, says, is the greatest commentary of the Christian religion. Now, we're going to look at this a little more carefully. We have seen enough now, very quickly, to start focusing in on this. This is a quotation, September 4th, 1844, found in Joshua V. Himes magazine, and it is a quotation of Martin Luther. Now, he's not the only one that uses the quote, but I'm using his because it can be found. Another one is found in Uriah Smith's writings. And uh, John Andrews also quotes it. But I'm going to give you the quote here of Martin Luther, and you see what you think. 
The allegorical sense is commonly uncertain and by no means safe to build our faith upon, for it usually depends on human opinion and conjecture only, on which if a man lean he will find no better than the Egyptian reed. <laughs> Therefore, Origen, Jerome, and similar of the fathers are to be avoided. And the whole of the Alexandrian school, when according to Eusebius and Jerome formerly abandoned in this species of interpretation. For later writers unhappily followed their too much praised and prevailing example, it has come to pass that men make just what they please of the scriptures until some accommodate the word of God to the most extravagant absurdities. <laughs> That's Martin Luther. He summed up origin very quickly. And he said the whole Alexandrian school is to be avoided. They're, they allegorize. They make anything they want out of the Bible. It's not safe to read them and study them and follow them. Is that what it said in this book? No, I think well, uh, Martin Luther understood some things. James White, in the Review and Herald of September 30th, 1862, on page 138, says this, Not until the time of origin, the magic allegorist, of whom Dr. Adam Clark has said, that on this plan of interpretation, the sacred writings may be obliged to say anything, everything, or nothing, according to the fancy, peculiar creed or caprice of the interpreter. So following origin is not a good idea, according to Luther, according to James White, according to Adam Clark, and we're going to see if we have time every other historian who ever wrote on the subject. All right? William Tyndale says this in Volume 1 of his, his book called Works on page 307. No man dare abide the literal sense of the text, but under protestation, if it please the Pope. You, you catch what he says here. Don't you dare interpret the Bible literally because the Pope doesn't like that. Well, where did the Pope get it from? Well, we know where he got it from. He got it from the Alexandria. He got it from Origen. We're going to see that as we go along here. Okay, back to the quote. This is William Tyndale. Thou shalt understand, therefore, that the Scripture hath but one sense, and that it is the literal sense. The greatest cause of which captivity and decay of faith, and this blindness wherein we are now, sprang first from allegories for origin, and the doctors of the time drew all the scriptures into allegory, insomuch as that twenty doctors expounded one text twenty different ways. Yea, they are come into such blindness that they not only say the literal sense profiteth not, but also that it is hurtful and kill the soul, killeth the soul. This is Tyndale. Do you think he knew anything? Well, all you have to do is read a little history and you'll see that's what they did. As a matter of fact, Origen taught you can come up with 30 different interpretations out of one scripture because there's that many in there and he says, and more! And the only way you can get that more it's to allegorize and say, it doesn't really mean that. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't really say that. It means this over here. And where did the other thing come from? To paraphrase, it is not something that is actually stated, but the concept is there. <laughs> In other words, don't see what God said, See what your imagination figures out and conceptualize something. That's in this book. Okay, we'll see that later. 
Mushaim, which is one of the most respected historians of all time, says this. Origen was at the head of this speculative tribe. This great man, enchanted by the charms of the Platonic philosophy, set up as the test of religions and imagined that the reasons of each doctrine would be found in that favorite philosophy, that is Plato, and their nature and extent to be determined by it. Its first promoters argued from that known doctrine of the Platonic school, which also was adopted by Origen and his disciples, that the divine nature was diffused through all human souls. Now he said a mouthful here, but he said what we want to hear right now. Origen is where it was formulated to the point where all the Christians of that age adopted it. He was the big deal. If Origen said it, that's what we believe, that's what we teach. What was Origen? He was a pagan philosopher. Where did he get his philosophy? from Plato. So we're going to spend some time before we're done here reading Plato to see what he taught, what he believed, and see how much of it Origen picked up because we'll see it in him too. And we will find it in the Roman Catholic religion, which means Luther was right. <laughs> he says, avoid that school of Alexandria. I will now read a statement by Origen himself. The scriptures are of little use to those who understand them as they were written. This is the great interpreter of scripture in the early church. I want to read that again. That bears reading twice. <laughs> the scriptures are of little use to those who understand them as they were written. So Ellen White was right, wasn't she? In early writings, she said, men changed their writings. Their thinking, of course, was the apostles didn't know how to say it correctly, so they, they improved the whole situation. And they changed the Greek manuscripts, not the originals, they couldn't do that, but they changed the Greek manuscripts to read the way they wanted to read them. And those corrupted Greek manuscripts became the basis of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, which became Westcott and Hort's modern revised version of the Greek text, which became all the modern versions of the Bibles today. They all come from Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, which came through Eusebius from Origen. Let me see if I can find something else here. Okay, I am going to read some excerpts from what the pioneers all believed and taught. And when I say they all believed and taught, I mean they all, almost word for word, they, they repeated these things in different works. They wrote this stuff in Signs of the Times, they wrote in Review and Herald, they wrote books, they wrote pamphlets, and they all agreed, always. So just reading one, you've got all of them, <laughs> okay? Well, I'm going to read some excerpts here. This is in a section called Origin. Origin was born at Alexandria about 185. It says on this point there's quite general agreement. Okay, I'm just picking out things. By proclaiming the reconciliation of science with the Christian faith, of the highest culture with the gospel, Origen did more than any other man to win the old world to the Christian religion. What is meant by science here? It's the same word that Alan White uses for the same purpose. The word science here means theology. Okay. So Origen made theology the Pagan theology, I don't know if we've ever discussed that pagans were very religious and they had their own religion. They had gods. And we will talk about who these gods were, what they did, and why the people were the way they were. We'll have to get into that. 
But for right now, paganism was highly organized, not in a solidarity, but in many, many kinds of religions that were all pagan. And these philosophers drew from all of those religions and the philosophies of those religions which the philosophers themselves believe. We'll detail this. Okay. This was fatal to the purity of the church. The science which he attempted to reconcile with the Christian religion was heathen philosophy. There, it's been said. So the science was heathen philosophy. And this is what Ellen White called science. It's heathen philosophy and we have missed it. Because we don't believe that Ellen White believes in a true philosophy. Well, she did. Okay. Gradually, the friends of philosophy and literature acquired the ascendancy. To this issue, Origen contributed very much for having uh, early imbibed the principles of the new Platonism. He inauspiciously applied them to theology and earnestly recommended them to the numerous youth who attended his instructions. So we have What's, what is it called here? New Platonism? It had several names before. It was Platonic. It took the name. Oh, uh, I forget. The, the School of Plato. It took several names. In the Dark Ages, it became known as Neo. Platonism, and today it's having a resurgence as Neoplatonism. But for here, it was New Platonism, and that's what Origen was involved in. He was teaching Platonism, and they all knew it, but it was no problem to them, and we'll see why. He enthroned a metaphysical theology above the supernatural revelation, difference between revelation and metaphysical theology. I'm going to remind you of something that you know. And let's see if we can begin linking some of these things. We have been told that Alan White matured. She grew in her understanding of the Trinity. Now, just according to what we know so far, that's a principle of the pagan philosophers to keep growing, to keep putting new information in, to keep studying the philosophers and increasing your personal philosophy until you get to the place where you are among the great thinkers. And when you die, you can go to be with God because only the great thinkers get to go to God. Okay, I haven't gotten into those things yet. But the point is here, was Ellen White a philosopher and she was growing in her understanding of who God is? She was developing philosophically? Or did she have a revelation from God and knew all the time the truth? <laughs> this book says she was a philosopher. She finally became mature. That's because the writers of this book are philosophers, and I'm going to prove that before we're done here. Okay. He enthroned metaphysical theology above the supernatural revelation and then took the role of a qualified interpreter. That's in this book, too. It says, we don't want to get too technical with you, you poor people who don't understand theology, so we'll break it down in a popular way. That's in this book. The pioneers knew where that was, what it meant. All of the pioneers, they would burn this book if they saw it, the pioneers. <laughs> All right. He took the role of a qualified interpreter of that revelation. Thus, by his wild style of allegorizing. This is the pioneer talking. By his wild style of allegorizing, muddling the clearest teachings and leaving the reader in utter bewilderment. All the pioneers believed this about Origen. They knew who Origen was. They knew who the Alexandrians were. All of them. 
because there are other books that I could show you about what the church fathers taught, what they believed, who they were, and they all agreed. All of them. Egypt was the birthplace of this allegorizing. It says, particularly Alexandria, which for a long time had been the seat of literature and every science, its followers chose to be called Platonics. There's another name. Now, there's something they did that I believe the devil brought in to make it look good. To make it look like something wonderful was happening here with these philosophers. See what you think about it. That controversial spirit in philosophy which obliges everyone to swear allegiance to the dogmas of his master, there is one of the principles of false education. What the teacher says is what you write in your, t your uh, test or you don't get an A. There it is. This philosophy was there. It says, was disapproved by the more wise. Hence, among the lovers of the truth and the men of moderation, a new class of philosophers had grown up in Egypt who avoided altercation and a sectarian spirit and who professed simply to follow the truth. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? They wouldn't argue, they wouldn't fight, they just followed the truth. <laughs> the question is, what is the truth? What did they think truth was? Yeah, we'll find out. They assumed, therefore, the name of eclectics. But, notwithstanding these philosophers were really the partisans of a sect, yet it appears from a variety of testimonies they much preferred Plato. So they were not the kind of people they said they were, that they agreed with everybody and everything was okay. They all believed in Plato. He was the big deal. So we have to go to Plato to find out what they really taught. This philosophy was adopted by much of the learned at Alexandria as they wished to be counted Christians and yet to retain the name, the garb, and the rank of philosophers. So, these philosophers claimed to be Christians, but they were in fact really still philosophers and they were glad to be seen as philosophers, pagan philosophers. Because there was no Christian philosophy they were familiar with. I, I can read you other things that show they did not really understand the Bible. They didn't know what was in the Bible clearly. They were teaching paganism. This is Moshe says Plato is wiser than all the others. That's what they believed. Now, what was, was it they were teaching that Alexandria... Being possessed of great fecundity of genius as well as eloquence, he, this is Ammonius, undertook to bring all systems of philosophy and religion into harmony. Bring everything together. Or in other words, to teach a philosophy by which all philosophers and the men of all religions, the Christian not accepted, might unite together and have fellowship. So, the first one who established school in Alexandria, he had this goal to make Christianity just another philosophy. Make it another philosophy that everybody could agree. The pagans, the Christians, everybody. P Plato, and all the other ones, Socrates. We'll get into Socrates a little bit, I hope. He said that all the philosophies of the world, including Christianity, were one and the same system of truth. That God had only one system of truth on this earth, and he shared that with every philosopher. And you had to find where it is among all these people. And once you found it, you would have the one true philosophy. <laughs> And Jesus was just another one of those. These are Christians. <laughs> these are supposed to be Christians. In, to these assumptions, he added the common doctrines of the Egyptians, where he was born and educated. This is, we're talking about origin again. 
concerning the universe and the deity as constituting the whole. Now, this historian who is telling us these things is telling us that Origen was a pantheist. That's what he understands by what he's read. To this Egyptico Platonic philosophy, the ingenious and fanatical man joined a system of moral discipline, apparently of high sanctity and austerity. Now, by that he means that when you looked at Origen, you saw only a pious Christian. That's all you could ever see with him, because he, he did things on a very high level. It is said that he even fixed himself where he could never be married. As a matter of fact, in his writings, he, in a very positive way, says, marriage is no good for people. People should not get married. He was against marriage. This book, I'm sorry, has too many things going against what everybody else knows. That the prevailing religions, and particularly the Christian, might not appear reconcilable with his system. We're back to Ammonius. Ammonius first turned the whole history of the pagan gods into an allegory. So he said, those gods aren't really the way they appear, and he allegorized them so he could fit them into Christianity. So he's allegorizing paganism, and he's allegorizing Christianity. This medley formed the basis of Origen's theology. It will be seen at once that Neoplatonism was nothing else but spiritualism. Now he has hit us where we can understand. Paganism is nothing more than spiritualism. Does Alan White have anything to say about spiritualism? It's the great enemy of Christianity. And Origen was a spiritualist. I didn't say a word of that in this book. Paganism, spiritualism... When the true inwardness of Neoplatonism is fully realized and is understood that it constitutes Origen's religion, the reader will wonder how Origen could ever be regarded as a Christian. Now this is a historian writing. A, a historian who is a Christian, obviously. And he asks the question, how could any, anybody regard Origen, Ammonius, Clement, how could he regard these people as true Christians? Well, that's in his book. And we are beginning to perceive there's something really wrong here that this book disagrees with all the informed people of history. There's a reason why. There's a reason why. Because that pagan sips symbol there, the triquetra, is a pagan symbol and has to be justified. And we'll see how. But we're just starting to dip into this subject. I'm sorry for all the quotations, but there's no other way to get at this. I can't just tell you what all these people said. We have to read their actual words and the words of the historians. The spirit of philosophizing so far from experiencing any decline or abatement continued to increase and diffuse itself more and more, particularly toward the close of this century, that's where these people were living, when a new sect sprung up in, uh, in Alexandria under the title The Modern Platonists. There's just so much to read here, it's hard to... In many passages, he, Origen, speaks disparagingly of the literal truth of the scripture narratives. Now that's what Origen himself said, didn't he? Anyone who reads the Bible literally, it's going to be damage him, it's going to hurt him. It's going to <laughs> They're not going to get anything out of it. That's what this historian is saying. He speaks disparagingly of the literal truth of the scripture narratives. This constitutes his retrogressive and disastrous originality. He constantly uses allegory where his own principles give him no excuse for doing so. 
he had so completely deadened to his own mind the feeling of historic truth that he allegorizes not only in such narratives as that of creation. Did you hear that? Yeah. The creation didn't happen the way the Bible says it. But even the law, he says God didn't say that law that way because it can't be kept. He says the law as it is in the Bible is impossible to do. So it can't be true. So he goes after the deep truths of the law to say what it really says, which he made up in his own mind. This is the hero of this book. The histories and the prophets. Now, I just want to give you some clues because we're never going to come back to this. We're going someplace else in this understanding. But he went so far as to say that it is impossible for the history week to have happened for example, how can you have a day one without a sky, without a sun, and without a moon, and without stars? He says, it's not possible, so it can't be true. <laughs> All right, I'll leave you to think about that. that. This man trapped the whole Christian world with his thinking. He goes through the days of the week to show the impossible things going on on each day. And he says it couldn't possibly have happened. Adam and Eve didn't happen the way it says. And he goes on and on. Now maybe I should tell you something else because I'm going to forget. I will never be able to recall this in another meeting. He says the stars have souls. They are alive. They have moral natures. The stars are living beings. Now you say, how could a man be so stupid? But let me tell you, he was not being stupid when he said these things. He came from a background that I just discovered today. I was reading through Plato's Phaedrus. And that's not easy stuff to read because he goes away out. You don't know what he's doing. But in that book, he talks about the stars. And it's a dialogue. And the question is asked, what about the stars? Are they not orderly? Oh yes, they're very orderly. The most orderly things you can see. The most orderly thing. They all move in a way that's absolutely perfect. Now, in philosophy, you cannot have motion unless there's something living. He says, those stars move. And they not only move, they move in perfect order. That means high reasoning power. <laughs> and so, I'm not going to take you through all of the things he does, but when he's done, he says, living being means soul, means motion, means knowledge, means, and he does the whole thing, and when he's all done, the stars are living souls. Origin got it from Plato! And Plato through that process came up with the immortal soul. I'm not taking you to the philosophies, I just want you to understand there are th things behind things behind things. And origin is the product. He's at the end of it. We had Socrates, we have Hippocrates, we have we've got bunches of people thinking who really spent their time thinking because it was their salvation. Their religion was to get so smart and understand so many true things that they could go live with God after they died. That is their spirit because their body was evil. They didn't need a body. Okay, I am giving you a background of the Sunday keeping apostasy, which came from the Catholic Church, which came through origin which came from Alexandria, Egypt. And Alan White says, we are steadily retreating toward Egypt. Is this making a little more sense now? All right. Time has run out for today, I'm afraid. There's just too much to this. I will try to pick up next session with a little bit more on origin, and we'll go from there. I just want to finish today by pointing out that the last age of the Christian church has a name. You all know that name. 
Laodicea. The Laodicean problem is a very interesting problem. It's called blindness. Now the question is, how did the last age of the Christian church get blind? What is that blindness? Did God make the last church blind? Well, obviously not. So how did they get blind? The answer is very simple. It's all biblical and spirit of prophecy. They didn't want to see. When a person doesn't want to see something, there's nothing you can do to make them see. They have chosen willfully to be blind. And so Laodicean condition is a choice. To choose to not see the truth of God makes a person Laodicean. And it is such a serious condition as far as God is concerned that Jesus says, You make me want to vomit. I can't get you down. Ellen White tells us what that, what that means for Jesus to vomit out what he put in his mouth. It means that once you're gone, he cannot bless you. He cannot bless your Christian work. He cannot bless you in your prayers. He cannot give you grace. That's a land to see it. Today we have a present problem because we are living in the Laodicean age. So Laodicean condition is the problem of the church today. One last thing for, this, for today. In volume 8 of the testimonies in the preface, it says that at that particular time in the church, we had the greatest crisis we had ever had. But Ellen White came to the rescue. No, it was not Ellen White. It was Jesus and the Spirit of Prophecy. Spirit of Prophecy. What was the crisis? They said it was pantheism. That's not what Ellen White says in the book. But in the preface to the book, that's what they say. They say that Kelly was teaching pantheism. Well, that's what he came up with, but that was not his problem. He was teaching a philosophy. It was the wrong philosophy. It was the philosophy that came through origin. The philosophy of origin that we have been talking about was trying to get into the Seventh-day Adventist Church through John Kellogg. What was his attack going to do? Alan White tells us it takes away the whole Christian economy. You have ruined the personality of God. So what was the issue? God, who is he? That was the issue. God is the Father. That's all there is to it. That's all the Bible says. But the allegorizers came along and says, no, he's a trinity. All right, that's all I'm going to say for today. You see where we're going now. We are going to lay history onto this to show that not only the historians knew all about this, but all of our pioneers knew it, but none of the people in our educational system seem to have any knowledge of these things. We'll talk some more. Father, we thank you for all of your wonderful mercy starts with. We know that we're just dust. We don't know very much about anything, and yet you have entrusted us with your gospel, and you've entrusted us with your spirit, and you have given us a mission. Yes, Jesus. Help us to move and to do the things you say. We let you take care of all the rest. Bless us as we continue to study and learn and to hear your voice. We thank you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.